Welcome to the 227th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today is a discussion in partnership with the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest of Villanova University with William Horn, Kira Kilty, and Finn Kennedy. They're the co-producers of the Bearing Witness Project, COVID-19 Oral History and the Public Good. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live, Twitch, and Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for guests and future topics. Please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, February 24th, 2021, there are 2,486,405 deaths globally from COVID-19. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 502,660 deaths in the United States from COVID-19, and that's up from 501,947 reported yesterday. It's a way to bring some humanity to the numbers. I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is from COVID to tracheostenosis. Austin College student dies of COVID complications. This was written by Jerry Whiteley and was published in the Sherman and Denison, Texas Herald Democrat, December 28, 2020. When 21-year-old Chris Miller arrived on Austin College's campus in Sherman, Texas this past fall, he was a 300-pound, six-foot-tall young man with his entire future ahead of him. On December 18, 2020, Miller died at the age of 22 after a months-long battle with COVID-19 and COVID-19 complications. Just before Christmas, Miller's sister, Honoria Bush, his mother, Esteria Miller, and the family attorney, Paul Stafford, reminisced about the young Austin College senior's life and his passing. Bush said her brother was very active at college. A statement on Austin College's website said he was an active member and officer of Chi Delta Eta fraternity, a little brother of Kappa Gamma Chi sorority, and a member of Black Expressions. He was completing a major in business administration with a minor in art, the statement said. He expected to graduate in 2021. His mother said he had just received his cap and gown shortly before coming down with COVID-19. Miller's fight began a few days after convocation, soon after a friend of his who had attended the ceremony tested positive for the virus. His two roommates would eventually test positive for it as well, but all Chris Miller had reported was that he had lost his sense of taste and smell, two commonly known symptoms of COVID-19. Then, on August 31st, Miller's roommate found him in the floor, struggling to breathe. His sister said he was first taken to the school nurse who noticed that oxygen concentration in Miller's blood was low, so he was taken to Wilson N. Jones Regional Medical Center in Sherman, Texas. By September 3rd, his sister said he required a BPAP machine and that day they transferred him to Texoma Medical Center in Denison because he would require more resources as far as his need for oxygen. The next day, the family received a call from the hospital saying he was going to need to be intubated. And they got another call saying that even with the ventilator at 100% oxygen, his levels were still in the 40s. So they requested to put him on an extracorporeal membrane oxygenation machine, which would drain the blood from Miller's veins, fill it with oxygen, and remove carbon dioxide and return it to his body. Actually bypasses the heart and lungs to get oxygenated blood to the rest of the body so other organs and tissues don't die, explained Bush, who is in her first year as an emergency room nurse. She said he was on that machine for almost two and a half months. 
In that time, he did have two negative COVID tests, so we were able to visit him, Bush said, and he even reached a point where he could breathe on his own. By early October, the tracheostomy that had been put in his throat to allow the ventilator access had even been removed, and he was stepped down to a lower level intensive care unit. On October 22nd, Chris Miller was released to rehab at home, but only a week and a half later, he began to have trouble breathing again. He was taken to Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. They found out he had a tracheostenosis, meaning that when they took out the trach the first time, it had healed the wrong way, his relative said. Tracheostenosis had narrowed his own trachea and his body was retaining too much carbon dioxide. On October 28th, they did an emergency surgery to put him back on a ventilator and they had to do another tracheostomy because they could not get a tube down his throat. Emily knew it would be a long road back because he would require several surgeries to fix his trachea. And on December 11th, those surgeries began. The doctor told him it didn't look good, Bush said. The doctor said his trachea was still inflamed. There was no way to go down in size. And this is what the plan was, to go down in size on an artificial trachea to allow his actual trachea to heal correctly. During all of this, Chris still was not able to talk to his family. December 17th started off like just another night for Bush's brother. She had talked to him on the phone and he was trying to use a device that would allow him to speak with them. And then at 11 p.m., everything changed. While grandparents were calling for an ambulance, his relative called her daughter and Bush told her mother to get towels to try to stop bleeding that had developed. He sank to the floor, slid out of bed, and laid on the floor, he said. Chris Miller was not able to overcome that incident, and he died. Bush said there were a few times during his fight with COVID-19 that they thought they might lose her brother. Twice, she said, they were called because the medical staff thought he would die from bleeding in his lungs. Family want people to know that COVID-19 is something to take very seriously. I would just tell people this virus is so unpredictable, Bush said. To see physicians and nurses look so lost because the virus is so unpredictable, one person can be perfectly fine, and then the next minute they're fighting for their lives on a ventilator. According to family, the real test for humanity is not that Chris's family cries for Chris, but for people who are not related to Chris to cry for him and to care for him. This is the real test for humanity, not having relatives or loved ones say what happened or to feel a sense of either regret or remorse or sorrow. It is for those who never knew Chris to feel that. That is when we will start turning the corner on this and healing as a nation physically and psychologically. Okay, we're going to turn to our discussion for today. I'm really pleased to welcome my guests. Let me introduce them to you. William Horn is the co-founder and editor of the Activist History Review and is an Arthur J. Ennis postdoctoral fellow at Villanova University. He writes about the relationship of race to labor, freedom, disability, and capitalism in post-Civil War Louisiana. He holds a PhD in history from the George Washington University. Kira Kilty is a doctoral student in the Theology and Religious Studies Department at Villanova University. Her work employs fashion theory and theological ethics to interrogate the fashion industry and its contribution to labor exploitation, racism, and environmental degradation. She's also interested in garments as loci of power, mystery, and presence in both religious and secular settings. Before coming to Villanova, she studied at Iona College in New Rochelle, New York, and received a bachelor's degree in religious studies accounting, religious studies, and a BBA in accounting. Dr. Fenella Kennedy, my third guest, is an assistant professor of dance at the University of Alabama. Their research, creative and theoretical, examines how different articulations of dance practices can shape our values and who we are as a society. Before joining the faculty at Alabama, Dr. Kennedy danced with Aegis Live Arts and Nutshell Contemporary Dance Company in Europe where they restaged Martha Graham repertory on undergraduate students. In their spare time, Dr. Kennedy teaches and organizes events for the blues and fusion social partner dance communities. Really pleased to have you all here today. Thanks for joining me on COVID Calls. So let me um, start the way I usually do, which is just to, um, just to 
uh, find out where you're each calling in from and what the pandemic situation is looking like there. And what I'd like to do is, if, okay, let me start with, um, Van, can I start with you on that? Yeah, sure thing. Where am I at because of the pandemic? Where are you calling in from and what's the pandemic situation there today? Okay, I am calling in from the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. I am in a curtained off corner of my living room. And at the University of Alabama, we are gradually going back towards more in-person operations with the hope um, that things can be more in-person from the fall. Um, the faculty are slowly getting vaccinated. I have had my first dose a few weeks ago and will receive my second dose on Friday next week, which I'm delighted by. Um, unfortunately, we have students who are catching COVID-19. We have people who are sick in the neighborhood. You may have seen us in the news at the beginning of the year when Tuscaloosa won the football and several thousand students flooded the streets of Alabama. Um, luckily after that, the university faculty were given permission to teach remote for the first two weeks, which is something the university has not done before. Um, so I took um, advantage of that for the start of my semester. Um, and now I'm teaching a combination of remote and hybrid classes. It's, you know, through the fall, and I, and I did see those uh, kind of shocking images from time to time from Alabama. I, I wonder, I'm not to speak for the university administration necessarily, but, you know, to have all of that happening with the politics of the fall, the campus must have been, I mean, there's this tension about being on campus at this time, but it must have been a really tense environment. It was absolutely, because there's, obviously in a campus environment and in a campus town, there's a stress between the folks who want to be as absolutely safe as possible and the pressure from your job and what you're being required to do and the folks who are really wanting to go out and act in ways that maybe I personally did not feel was safe. Um, and as a university instructor, you don't know who is in your classroom. It was deemed quite early on that despite having a COVID tracking app, a student in your class was not considered close proximity to you. So instructors were not informed if students in their class tested positive for COVID. Um, which, so we've been dealing with a lot of um, cultural shifts and lacks of information and trying to make the best of it that we can. Um, I think everyone has been very graceful with each other. I know a lot of our students have faced some incredible hardships over the last few semesters around family loss and economic hardship. Um, and I'm lucky that we're in a department that's small enough where we feel like a, a family and we've tried to handle that as best as we can together. And I'm sorry at the introduction, I, I, I read some biographical information for you, but I think I might not have captured everything you wanted to say. Is there something else you wanted to add in terms of just your own background? Mm -hmm understand the context of your work. Oh, it's mostly that the name that I have on my screen, which is Dr. Fenn Kennedy, is my name, and that is the one I'd prefer to be used. Thank you for that correction, and my apologies for that at the, at the top. That's all right. Kira, if I could turn to you now, where are you calling from? And, and same question, what's the pandemic situation there today? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. This is wonderful. Um, it's great to talk about the project and these issues. I am calling in from Ardmore, Pennsylvania, so on the main line as it's called, and I'm about uh, 10 minutes from Villanova's campus and about in the opposite direction, 20 minutes from Philadelphia. Right now in Montgomery County, which is the county I'm technically in, uh, COVID cases have gone down. Um, they're slightly better than Philadelphia, um, but COVID is still um, around and it's still concerning. I don't really have an idea into how campus is doing just because um, I am not on classes on campus. I actually have set up my own little um, student space in my apartment just for uh, my own safety and for my own concerns because I do have some health uh, issues. So it's been great to have that space and to have been accommodated by the university um, and my hope is, I know that um, campus is still doing some uh, in-person classes, um, offering remote accommodations. I, I hope that remote accommodations will still be honored uh, 
come fall and not seen as kind of this um, gift to students. It would be nice if we could continue the um, sentiment that it is important and uh, is doable. It's not my favorite way to learn, for sure. I miss people. I miss classroom experience. I miss seeing my colleagues and my friends, but um, it's better than the alternative. And I like to know that I'm not contributing to anyone getting COVID or spraying it around. Well, uh, that yeah. sentiment that you're describing is one that I've heard from um, several folks I've talked to in the disability rights community who've really made this point that, you know, student the universities can make the pivot to accommodation in all kinds of ways. A pivot that we were told, not every university, but many universities had said, well, that's not possible, it's not viable. Well, it turns out it is viable. And Kira, your question about, well, what will be the, will it be a pivot back or will there continue to be a broader range of educational outreach and support services is, a, is one that I think it really resonates very broadly. But how have you maintained your sort of academic and intellectual community at this time then, if you're working in this more remote space? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, it's a lot of calls. Um, I, like maybe all of us, get screen fatigue now every day. So I tend to opt for a lot of phone calls with colleagues and friends. I have uh, taken up letter writing again, which has been wonderful. But since the post has been a bit delayed, it's really just a matter of um, communication with colleagues. And it's not always in it the academic vein. So it doesn't just have to be, well, you know, what are you working on? Um, doing a kind of virtual study space. So that is really helpful. It's also checking in and um, looking out for each other. Um, but I have taken advantage of a lot of different, um, I would say, online webinars offered by the university and also webinars offered by other universities and other organizations. That certainly has been a benefit though I do uh, sympathize with the speakers because it's just so much easier to corral people into uh, different events now. Um, hopefully their uh, schedules aren't too overloaded, but uh, it's just been kind of uh, spreading spreading my wings out and taking advantage of the different talks that are on. Um, I, you know, I've gone into different calls in England and other places, and um, that would not be possible uh, without this kind of shift to virtual as being a kind of a new normal. Um, this normative way of learning, which it is good, I think, in some ways, it's good. William, coming to you with the same question, where are you located now and, and what's the pandemic looking like there? Yeah, and I just wanna say again, thank you for, for having us. Um, really excited to be having this um, conversation and uh, working through really what we're all working through right now um, together in community, um, be it online. Um, so I'm just down the street uh, from Kira, and so I'll just sort of like wave in your direction, Kira. I'm in Bryn Mawr, um, which is the next town over towards um, <laughs> towards back. campus. Thank you. <laughs> um, towards Villanova from um, from Ardmore, I guess where she is. Um, and uh, things are okay. Uh, I am a parent. I have three uh, children, um, two of whom are school age, and so that's been um, a little bit difficult um, to navigate because, like. You know, most places in the country, um, you know, they are not having um, full-time in-person instruction. They're in a hybrid model, um, actually, just like I am. <laughs> um, and so I, I teach, uh, you know, in a hybrid model um, on campus um, part-time and then off campus online part-time. Um, and so it's been an adjustment um, for everyone. But I think, you know, I just want to echo, um, you know, my colleagues here. It, I've been grateful um, for everyone's flexibility. I've been grateful for the opportunity. Um, to you know, continue doing something that I love in a bit of a different way. Um, we did have um, you know a bit of an an outbreak on campus recently, um, and you know, on the one hand, obviously that's something no one wants to deal with. It's you know incredibly disheartening, uh, you know, given all that we've done to try and be safe. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, the community really did um, pull together, and I think we have. Um, you know, that really uh, very much under control now. Um, and so, you know, again, that's something to be grateful for, you know, so I guess, um, you know, as I wrap, you know, um, there's, there's silver linings, um, you know, and that's um, a lot of how I'm approaching this right now. The balance of home life and work life, which is everyone tries to keep in the right balance according to their own lives and values 
um, has now been uh, compressed. And as you pointed out, you know, that's certainly probably had an impact on you. I, I wonder, you know, you said you're managing remote, children are managing remote. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that, but also particularly in, in terms of how you manage um, projects and complicated research meetings and various other things. I speak for myself that um, with two children at home, they've shown interest in my work. You know, dad's work is now in the next room instead of in some other city um, where the office is. And I, my oldest son is engaged in the COVID calls with me. He helps out with it. It's been, um, it's been quite good in that sense. I, mean, I don't want to paint everything um, with a silver lining necessarily, but that has been a silver lining for me. I don't know if you share that um, or how, what, what your reaction to that might be, William. Yeah, thank you. That's um, a, a wonderful way to look at it and very much a silver lining. I've enjoyed spending, um, you know, a lot more time with them. It has um, made me prioritize some work um, over other work, you know, and so um, a project like this, which has a public facing component, you know, is something that I've prioritized because I think that, you know, we have to make sense of this thing together as a larger community, um, you know, and so I've put book projects um, and article projects more to the side or on, the, on a back burner, you know, until they really have um, the time to deal with it. But I, I have had, you know, a great time um, doing kindergarten <laughs> with my kindergartner, um, you know, and I wouldn't have had that opportunity, um, you know, under I guess, normal circumstances, really. Um, and so that's been great. Um, and she, you know, my kindergarten age daughter is very social and joins a lot of my Zoom classes sort of halfway through to show off an outfit or something. And um, it's, it's been really, it's been wonderful. You know, they've, they've taken it in stride um, and, you know, uh, everyone's been very gracious. So it's, it's really, you know, in many ways, I think um, kind of highlighted the, the best of, of who we are as, as people. Maybe, you know, students appreciate the fact of understanding that we're human beings. What a, what a, a reminder to them that you know, Zoom has made some of that um, backstory of the professor a little bit more available to them. I'd like to remind everybody you're listening to COVID calls and we're having a special discussion as part of my partnership with the LePage Center today. And we're talking about the Bearing Witness Project, COVID-19 Oral History and the Public Good. I'd like to turn to that now. Finn, if you don't mind, I'd like you to, could you introduce the project to us and let us know kind of some of the ambitions and how you all came to work together? Um. I think that's actually William's baby. Can I pass that to him? Because he's very much been the driving force of this project. Sure. Okay, William, I'll, I'll let you take the first pass and I'll bring others in. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I've had the most touch points with different organizations and so that you know is, um, makes sense for me. Um, so I, um, I, I think this all started with a tweet, to be honest with you. Um, I, I wrote a, an op-ed with a, a colleague in the, in the nation about how we need a, a new deal for our higher education system. Um, and I you know, tweeted a call for videos. Um, and um, I think um, you know, one of our colleagues uh, at the Hope Center saw the tweet and you know, it, it sort of uh, took off there. So we've partnered with um, the Hope Center, which is based in Temple uh, in Philadelphia just down the street uh, the other way. Um, and, uh, and we've also partnered with Active Minds, um, which is a national mental health advocacy organization for undergraduates. Um, and so they bring various uh, resources to the table and also touch points with students from across the country and, and even um, you know, across the world. Um, and so we've had a wonderful time um, sort of hearing their stories um, and thinking through um, how they fit together in our sort of larger collective story um, about COVID and how it's um, impacted us, um, as well as, especially in the US, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests and how that's uh, changing how students um, approach, you know, the learning experience, um, approach their campuses and approach their communities. Just to, well, first of all, to underline the Hope Center at Temple, which is tremendous. And I've had David Kopish on as a guest and who's engaged um, with that, and we talking, I was talking with him uh, in an episode about a just recovery. Um, you know, so what would a just recovery? If we get to that stage when we get to that stage for COVID look like. Um, so, if people are interested in hearing more about that, they can check out that conversation from October. But um, William, just to ask a, a follow up, and then I'll bring others in on this. Um, just in terms of developing the method, uh, lots of different ways to 
try to gather data right now in the moment as a disaster is unfolding. How did you settle on yours? Um, yeah, I, I, again, you know, it's sort of started with the tweet. Um, the Hope Center had a project that was um, going on already. Um, their, their bearing witness project, uh, which is a survey, um, and they had collected some data and were still collecting data um, on, uh, you know, through the survey with with their students who were in their network um, and educators um, and. As part of that, they had sort of an option that people could click, you know, would you want to share your story at some point? Um, and we just sort of collided at the right time, um, and we became sort of the, the vehicle for uh, for that story sharing. Um, it's been really, um, really powerful. Uh, it's sort of similar um, story with Active Minds. They had a survey out um, gathering information on kind of the mental health climate um, relative to COVID-19 on campuses. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've had some really um, interesting and powerful conversations uh, related to that through them. Ben, can I bring you in on this, to your perspective on it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am I'm a, I'm a dance researcher and that is what I do. And obviously the pandemic um, completely disrupted that part of my teaching. If I want to teach a dance class, I have to kind of move all the furniture and and, and push around my living room. Um, but I'm also a historian and I do a lot of work um, trying to make sure that people's voices get heard and particularly marginalized voices get heard. So when the COVID pandemic started, I began a project called How Do We Go Forward? How Do We Go Back? Um, which is a series of conversations quite similar to this one actually about returning to academia and I asked people from different walks of academic life how they would how they would come back in in the fall and what would be the best route for them, what were they struggling with. Um, and I'd done a little oral history work before, and that project it was it felt like just the most valuable thing that I could do with my time. And William, I collaborate on the Active History Review. So when I saw that he was looking for people with an interest in oral histories to interview undergraduates. I absolutely leapt on board and just dove in and interviewed a lot of students. Um, and basically I, just, I wanted to know what students were experiencing because I wanted that to shape my teaching. Um, and I wanted to make sure that when I, when I went back into my own teaching that I, I knew what the student experience was. Um, so that, has really, that was really my interest in it and how I came on board. Kira, let me get your perspective on this, particularly because I think you've been engaged in some of the, the interview work itself, right? Yes, I have. So I, um, I'm a contractor, student contractor on the project, and it's been, um, it's been a, I'd like to say it's been a joy to, you know, work through the different transcriptions, but it, it also is, um, it's heartbreaking. It, it's really um, upsetting, and I would say, as a graduate student, there are difficulties that come with my position and, um, you know, in terms of healthcare and in terms of eventual teaching. I do have colleagues who are teaching now. Some have gotten um, remote accommodations, some have not. But I do also have friends who, uh, you know, graduated from undergrad in May of uh, the pandemic. And there's just been a, a layer of losses uh, really, and you can see that in the interviews. Now, the interviews are not just of students, they're of faculty and of uh, other staff, but reading the student perspectives is, um, it, it's really quite tremendous in, in how overwhelming um, the situation is for people. And, and the thing is that there is no one uh, like student archetype. There is a diversity to um, the student body. Um, you know, there's, we have, some interviewees who um, are single parents um, who are, you know, returning to undergrad um, to study uh, students from the Midwest, students of color, uh, students of, of different backgrounds, and that all informs the college experience to begin with. And then you throw in a pandemic and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and just absolute economic strife, and it is it's a whirlwind of, of misery. Um, so I've been thrilled to see this project really taking great care to address um, the pains and, and the burden that people are shouldering and trying to par parse through it, make sense of it, and um, look forward um, in terms of just repair, repair and, and support, which really is proving to be uh, crucial right now as we enter the second year, really. 
I was intrigued by the title of the project, William, the uh, bearing witness part, of course, um, resonates broadly in terms of an oral history project, uh, asking people to tell their story, bear their, their witness. The attachment of oral history to the public good I found fascinating and an important link. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about why these stories aggregate up to something that we would call uh, service towards the public good. Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I think, you know, broadly speaking, we, we need to remind ourselves um, that we're talking about people's lives here, you know, and um, we on the project have an opportunity uh, to do that uh, for, for students, faculty and staff, you know, to help tell their stories on sort of a larger scale, um, what the, for what the pandemic has been like for them on, on campuses, how that's impacted their experiences, um, you know, what, what, what needs they have, right? Um, and so a lot of the, the responses that we've gotten, you know, very much articulate um, needs both in the present and, you know, sort of looking towards the future. Um, and I've, you know, been able to keep in touch with, you know, keep in touch with some of the interviewees and, um, you know, have found some good things to come out of, of the, the pandemic, people getting um, jobs and things like that who were very worried about not being able to, right? Um, but, you know, these are ultimately human problems that we face in, in a policy world, you know, um, and, and especially in a university setting, we really need to remind ourselves that, you know, we really are communities um, made up of these people. Um, and that's how I, you know, envision uh, the, the public good that we're doing. I'd like to hear about some of the themes that are emerging and some of the um, kind of early findings that you might be able to point to here. I don't know who'd like to speak to that first. I'd like to hear maybe from everybody about it. Who'd like to jump in on that first? Just what are you, what are you learning in a sort of broader landscape sense? Maybe Finn or Kira? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the interviews that I conducted were early in the pandemic. And some of the themes that came out for, were, for me I noticed a contrast between the students who had somewhere to go and the students who really had nowhere to go. Um, the students who kind of had a stability network and the students who really did not have a stability network. And it made such a difference. And I know that it seems trite to say that the circumstances of people's lives affected like their entire interaction with the pandemic. Um, but really, if there was inequality in someone's life before the pandemic started, the pandemic magnified it. And I was thinking of, um, I just remember one student who um, was an undergraduate and in the process of coming out as queer and all of a sudden had to go back home and was in a very religious household, couldn't speak to her parents. And actually, almost turning back to this question about the public good, what I found was this: there was this tremendous need for people's voices to be heard. Um, and a lot of students in particular, they were seeing so many voices represented um, on a national scale and on a media scale and on an institutional scale, but not their own voices. Um, and after so many interviews, because we had, a, we had a list of questions and we worked through the list of questions, and then I, the, the formal interview would be over and I would say, would, would you just like to talk for a minute? And once the camera was off, we'd go on talking and maybe it was just someone who wanted to be frustrated in a way they couldn't be on camera or someone who needed professional advice and they didn't know where to go to. So just talking about themes, but also talking about the public good, the idea that like people needed, people needed to be heard um, and just as like with individual grief and individual trauma, we know that talking about it is a mechanism towards healing. When we have a national and international trauma, talking about it is still a mechanism towards healing. What we have is a shortage of listeners. Um, and our project in some ways was an opportunity to be that, even if it was outside of some of the formal questions that the work needed doing. Well, that really strikes a chord with me and with others I've talked to about the um, maybe the broader role of social sciences and humanities right now in these kinds of projects. And your, your description of when the camera goes off or when the microphone goes off, 
Uh, and I can't tell you how many times I had Zoom classes in the fall where when the Zoom meeting ended, but there'd be that one or two students who stayed after, just as they would probably ordinarily, but with a much more acute need to really talk. And that's part of this as well. I know you're not presenting this project as a therapeutic intervention, but informally it must be so. Kira, I wonder if you have had that experience yourself and same kind of question to you, what other kinds of um, landscape level sort of broader themes are you pulling out of the work? Uh, I would absolutely agree that it is, it's very cathartic to, um, I imagine to conduct the interviews, which I did not do, um, and to take part in them, and also to parse through them and see, oh wow, this person is having a similar experience to me, and also be greeted with, oh wow, this person has a completely different experience, and grappling with with privilege and, and things like that. But um, to that point, one of the key themes that I think factors in here is one of mental health, and um, Dr. Kennedy was, you know, kind of speaking to that um, in terms of a shortage of listeners and also a shortage of people who really know how to listen. I, I don't think we quite know how to listen. We know how to talk past each other and talk at each other, um, but not really um, be there to, to just hear um, and to receive that pain. Um, so in terms of the mental health category, um, you know, across the board, and we know this, that people have really been struggling during the pandemic and putting forth their best effort to abide by uh, different CDC guidelines and to keep others safe. But um, jobs have been lost and um, the interviewee that Dr. Kennedy was speaking to being dislocated from um, their community that was really affirming and, and to lose that, I mean, that's traumatic. Um, to lose a job is traumatic, which happened to interviewees and, and their friends too. And again, I'm really not that far removed from this project in that even though I'm a PhD student, I'm in my early 20s and I have friends in undergrad and um, I'm seeing this in my own life too. I'm seeing it happen to my colleagues and those who I call friends. So um, yeah, there's really just a, a magnificent amount of, of data in terms of people processing the the pain of this time. And again, as I said earlier, just the layers of, of losses. Um, again, particularly for students, you know, they've lost friends, they may have lost professors, parents. And then also, and this is not, I don't think we should downplay this other kind of loss, you know, this loss of ceremony, losing the, the graduation. Um, mm. And I did not have a, I, I received a, a master's alongside with the working on the PhD and I didn't have a ceremony. I was fine, but I, I think if I had been a senior in college, I would have been really, really devastated. Um, and I, there, there are other themes that I could speak to, but I'll, I'll step back then. Yeah, the mental health one was really, really generative in that way. Well, congratulations on receiving the master's degree. And Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and it's also, it's really important, right? These ceremonies, which sometimes under ordinary times, maybe we would say, uh, we might even say, I don't, I don't care about that. You realize the yeah. opportunities for people to gather around you and say, hey, great job. They're actually pretty few and far between. To sacrifice yes. those means a lot, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say, this is funny. I was having a discussion with a colleague. This was uh, fall of 2019. And uh, he and I were kind of joking like, oh, well, we'll be we opt in because it was a built in masters. So it's it, it almost felt like, well, you know, we'll have the, the doctoral graduation. So it's not really necessary that we go. I mean, I ended up really wanting to. So it was disappointing. But just a, an immediate shift in, and having that option taken from us was was quite something. And you see in the interviews, too, um, this is especially difficult for the first generation students because it, it's kind of a mark in their family of this new newfound achievement. And to kind of just have a little ceremony on Zoom and maybe you get mailed a champagne flute and, and that's it. It's like an okay consolation prize, but it, it doesn't measure up. So my hope is, and I have heard some colleges and universities make promises that students will have a ceremony eventually. And I, I do hope they'll fall through on that because that seems to be a really crucial ritual and uh, more important than we might intuit. The pandemic is a, a meeting ground of multiple disasters. And William, I want to talk with you and, and with others about this, that 
you know, you had the disease itself and of course the disruption and then the economic precarity, um, which we were just talking about, but, but also this profound moment of racial injustice in a long line of racial injustice in the history of this country and around the world, but really brought literally into the living rooms, onto the screens of people and, you know, cities rightfully and, and students rightfully uh, stood up. And, you know, young people across America have led so many times recently in climate change activism, in uh, safety in schools activism, and now um, with the fight for for racial justice. William, how did that intersect with this project? I'd like to know a little bit about what you heard from students, but also how you thought about your research design in the midst of that as well. Thank you. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, so I, I guess I'll like narrow in um, on, on one student because I think her story is just really uh, profound. Um, she, she graduated um, and she's a teacher now, so I guess I'll narrow in on a teacher. <laughs> but um, she uh, went to John Jay, uh, Cassandra Johnson, um, and uh, she majored, uh, she had a background in uh, women's and maternal health um, and sort of an emphasis on uh, black women's mater maternal outcomes. She was also a single mom um, as she was going through um, undergrad and, you know, now teaches um, in, um, teaches in Brooklyn. Um, and so, you know, I think for her, you know, she, she's a black woman um, and she saw, you know, the pandemic affecting her, her life, right? Um, saw the, uh, the ways that the protests uh, were impacting her neighborhood, um, you know, and, and saw the ways that, you know, policing can impact her life, you know? I mean, she had been involved in, in protests, you know, going back to 2015, um, you know? And so I think, you know, we've really been in this prolonged period since, um, you know, the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement um, that, you know, where students and, and faculty and, and our whole communities really have been working through um, these issues. And, and now to sort of be stuck at home um, and to sort of have almost nothing else to really like think about, um, nothing else to do to take our minds off of it. Um, I, I found my students have been profoundly impacted by that moment um, and, you know, teaching, even, I don't know, um, common texts, you know, like a Martin Luther King text or something like that, that students have encountered before, um, their interaction with it is radically different. Um, in terms of my research, um, you know, I, I research broadly speaking, black emancipationist movements and their relationship to white supremacist movements. Um, and so, you know, I've been very interested, um, particularly in students and, and campus re responses um, to the Black Lives Matter uh, protests, um, responses to calls for racial justice, because I think we all know it's no surprise um, that uh, that campuses in many ways have been sort of magnifiers of, of inequality, amplifiers, uh, even as they sort of pitch themselves as being quite the opposite, as um, a means of social mobility. Um, and in fact, um, you know, in terms of, of the debt and, and access issues, very much the opposite has been the case. I mean, so it's been a really, um, exciting time, I think, to be having those discussions with administrators um, and to be networking um, with people across the country who care deeply about um, a more equitable future um, and, and really see this as a time uh, to bring that about. Fan, let me bring you in on this. And there's one particular part that I, I wonder if you, um, to get your sense of it, is how the mood of students might be fluctuating because I know um, others I've spoken to in my own experience that in May and June and July, um, it was an active time. And campuses, many I think around the country, um, didn't tell students, hey, you should just sit tight in the dorm. I think that may be a bit of a mixed picture across the country. Um, certainly not in Philadelphia, they didn't do that. But by the fall, the mood had shifted somewhat. Uh, among some students that I talked to, they were worried that there was going to be a reversion back to just normal and that the moment had already slipped past. That's just my own experience. I haven't done it uh, in sort of in-depth analysis of the interviews the way you're all working on. What's your what's your take on this? Um, so my take, I was thinking what you said about research design, and we quite deliberately um, structured a discussion of Black Lives Matter into our research questions. Um, 
because we we wanted to go in with the expectation that all students were thinking about this moment of racial injustice, um, that it wasn't an issue that maybe only niche populations of students would be thinking about. And I think going in that with that assumption was very helpful because I think that students were um, hungry to talk about these issues. And I'm thinking particularly of one student who I connected with, and I connected with her deliberately because she was actually at um, the Ohio State University, which is where I got my own PhD. So I had been familiar with some of the campus climate and some of the city climate um, around these issues. And Columbus Police Department is brutal. Um, and it has a very militant response to protests. Um, and so I was, I, I had I had a lot of background context about what it might be like to be a student and a Black Lives Matter organizer and a campus activist, all of which she was, she's an incredible young woman, um, and trying to both like make demands and advocate for students and take care of herself and advocate for racial justice. And just running into roadblocks because and running into administrative roadblocks and delays and slowdowns and th we have to go in with a measured response um and i don't think that's unique to any particular university i think there's um the activist movement is always very hungry for this is the thing you need to change now it is killing people we need to do something about it and there's often a deferment to the long-term goal and the big picture strategy. And I can see that as being institutionally useful, but it's always also very frustrating to the folks who need the change to happen right now. Um, and so I think in the fall, there was a lot of hope that people would make change right now. Um, and in some places that change has happened and there's been quite an upswell of hope. And in some places there has been that, okay, now we're settling down a bit and we can move towards those delays and those institutional things. And as it moves into the, the cogs of bureaucracy, things get slowed down and things get minimized. Um, there is one thing about student mood though, which, has, which I want to touch on, which is when I began teaching history in the United States, and I used to teach in the UK and English, um, you had to, and especially me as a transgender professor, you have to be very, very careful about what you state as fact. And at the beginning of my teaching career, I had to caveat the idea that there was racism in the United States. I had to be very cautious around how I made that, state, that statement and to what extent I made it. I don't have to be cautious around that statement anymore. Um, I can walk into a room and I can be aware that my students are on the same page that racism exists in the United States. And that seems like such an obvious thing to talk about, but it is a monumental shift in the culture of students that they are more tuned in, they are watching the news, they're more politically aware, um, they're able to have critical discussions about what is going on in the world around them. And I think that often students get um, ignored or dismissed or their viewpoints are thought of as inherently superficial um or and i just one of the wonderful things about these interviews is just collecting so much data that says no student voices are valuable that they are educated that they are aware that they have solutions um for the for the future of education or for covid or for the country and that we need to be listening to them um this spring i think the mood has shifted to exhaustion <laughs> really if i were to put it in a nutshell, as more and more people are dealing with grief and loss and hardship. Um, but that would be my summation of where the students have been as I've kind of tracked them through the last, I don't know how many months. Fan, I, I mean, just to make that statement, racism exists in the United States as a starting point for conversation. Um, and I really like the way you put it that, um, to, to somehow recapture that as, as something that we don't just treat as a, yeah, we're gonna get to that in the curriculum, racism was, was a thing, but to actually be attentive to the verb tense there. Uh, William, I wonder if that's resonated with, for you in the work that you've been doing in this project. Again, this, again I'm really struck by this public good um, and, the, and the reservoir of, of 
interviews not only as serving as a public good, but also creating a public good. That is, the, the interviews themselves serve the public good by hearing a, a, a critical mass of student voices saying, no, this matters to us right now. Right, yeah, and I, I don't think that we've encountered uh, a single interview, um, and I haven't encountered a, a single student who isn't uh, attuned to um, what's happening, um, you know, in terms of uh, racial injustice um, and the need for racial justice and a racial reckoning um, in our country. And that is astronomical. I, I've been teaching for a, a long time uh, too. Uh, and, you know, I'm from uh, the deep South where, um, you know, we have uh, lots of cliches about things and for a reason, right? Um, you know, the, it's the racism structures things uh, a great deal, um, you know, where I'm from. Um, and I, I think universally across the board, um, you know, even back home, people acknowledge like things are bad and, and need to change. Um, and I think that's really important, you know, and um, I, I think one of the things that's really powerful about um, this project is sort of realizing the extent to which, um, you know, many of us are sort of on the same page, like where we are now um, in terms of in terms of COVID, in terms of access to medical care. Um, in terms of access to education, in terms of access to opportunities. None of these things are sustainable um, over the long term. And that's come out in pretty much every single interview that, uh, that, I, that I've you know, come across is, is that you know, this just isn't feasible over the long term. Something needs to change. Um, and you know, I think um, everyone was sort of feeling that um, in, in the moment uh, as we're all locked down and um, and Black Lives Matter erupts, you know, um, and and I think um, it just it felt like a, a I don't know a, a great gulp of of oxygen. Um, and, and you know, talking to um, interviewees at, at the time, you know, that's uh, that's how they um, you know expressed it that, that things really are changing and and things can be better um, and that we can have you know a more equitable and just future. Um, I think you know people have been really excited about that, um, and it's been frustrating um, to see some of the, you know, as Fen pointed to, the, the sort of strategies of, of diversion and, um, you know, the institutionalization of, um, of the revolution, I guess, right? Um, and yet, um, you know, uh, obvious, I know, I should, revolution, I shouldn't have, but, um, um, but uh, you know, things can change. Um, and I think the project points to that, which is um, exciting. A reminder, you're listening to COVID Calls, and I'm talking today with Fenn Kennedy, William Horn, and Kira Kilty about the Bearing Witness Oral History Project with a focus on college students throughout the pandemic, but um, bringing in the various different dimensions of the, of the disaster as we've been discussing. We have a few minutes left. I'd actually like to hear how you, how you think that these findings, your interviews, but maybe adjacent uh, data sets, um, can and should be mobilized going forward. What do you expect to come out of this work? What would you like to come out of this work? Uh, how would you like university administrators to hear these voices, but beyond the walls or beyond the classrooms? Um, who else needs to be engaging with this work? Kira, let me start with you um, on this, and then we'll, we'll give everybody a chance to feedback on it. Well, something that comes to my mind, and it's um, out of my own experience of collaborating with other graduate students and adjunct uh, faculty, is there's there's a hope of mine that this material and this data would um, mobilize solidarity, um, at least uh, speaking right now um, of the university, among students and with professors. And this is something that I've, I've kind of um, encountered you know, you'll see it on Twitter or other social media. There's, there's just this gap between students and and teachers, and unfortunately, these sentiments that professors are out to get students and that they won't be accommodating it, that that somehow they're they're the enemy. Um, you know, making big bucks and uh, don't have students' best interests in mind. Now, I'm I mean, there are those who are like that, I'm sure. But um, if I've learned anything from speaking with adjunct um, professors who like, can't afford to eat uh, and are on food stamps currently and are teaching students that there is a way for us to, to kind of come together and um, 
demand more and, and to take care of each other. I also um, think that, again, back to Dr. Kennedy's point about listening and, and sharing our stories, that there's just, there's so much room to really uh, cultivate practices of mutual aid across communities. And um, that that's a personal hope of mine, uh, that that would be something that's incorporated into the student body and, and student practices, but also out, outside of um, the university walls too. Um, and then a final point, if I can make it, is because we have been so far from each other and um, have not been able to really engage in person. And I mean, personally, I went back home during the pandemic to rural upstate New York. So I was not in any protests or um, activism engagements, which is unlike me. I'm hoping that we can uh, reimagine and, and think creatively about how we can be activists. You know, is it enough that we're um, going to say a, a climate protest that has been approved by a city and, you know, it's been okayed by the police and you go to X point and, and Y end point. I don't think that is, um, that's good enough. Um, and I think there are ways to be creative about how we're raising these issues. And uh, I, I, my hope is that solidarity will uh, fuel us in this so we, we can um, lean on each other as we are tired. Ben, let me get to, thank you for that, Kira. Um, and 100% endorsement of all of those sentiments. Personally, and again, I think it's also the power of an oral history archive, is that those voices of action um, can slip away. Sometimes that slippage um, is just because we don't take care to collect them. Other times it's a little bit more structural. Uh, we don't, not us, but maybe others don't want to hear those voices or have them collected. That seems to me an important intervention of your work. Uh, ben, where do you want to see the project going as we move through 2021 and beyond? Mm -hmm. um, I'm remembering a couple of students who I was talking about um, ideas of where they would like to see the project go, and they were they were they wanted to be published. They wanted to be heard. They're like, let's put it out on a book. Let's put it online. Put up my bio. Put up my website. Like get like I would like people's attention. I would like people to listen to me and learn from me. I have stuff to like the world can grow from, um, and like. A student who just, I, I asked, what question do you wish I would have asked you? Um, and she said, I wish you'd ask me what abolition means. I, okay, what does abolition? She went, oh, great. I learned things from that one-off question that I didn't know and that have shaped my own activism going forward. Um, and so thinking about, I would love to, I would love to see this project valued as, um, an opportunity for learning and growth and engagement. Um, we're often in we're often in the social media sphere put into. Um, Kira talked about the student teacher divide, but we also have this generational divide um, that goes on. And I think we need to start, um, especially from the younger generation of activists who are so aware and who are so fluent and who are so conscious of intersectionality. I like the more the more we can give them access to forums like this one and the more we can give them a chance to teach us I think the better we will do um as a collective if we if we're trying to shape the world and I I believe William um can speak to that um in some ways that he's taking that project forward William let's hear from you on that and, and I just want to make sure that um we keep in the front of our minds something that Ben said earlier, which I really, really like, which is that we need more listeners right now. And uh, now I'm going to ask you to talk, but <laughs> this is talking by way of fostering listening. And I think that's what an oral history project can ultimately um, aspire to be. It's, it's describing a mode of practice um, for society that needs to come out of these kinds of disasters. Um, this is my own point of view, but um, from from your point of view, and I was, I'm going to put on the screen here a link to a, a special issue of the Activist History Review that you edit um, that does begin to mobilize some of this work. Let's hear more about your plan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, so many of the students who were interviewed in this project um, also contributed sort of their essays uh, to this special issue. Um, and so, you know, we have been in the process of kind of figuring out how to get 
uh, their voices out there. Um, another element of that um, is putting together these sort of shorter uh, issues, uh, issue videos, I guess, um, that compile several of their stories around a particular issue, be it mental health, um, be it food access, things like that. And so those are very policy oriented. Um, and so I guess that's a public good issue I should have mentioned earlier, it sort of slipped my mind. Um, but I said the word revolution, so it's okay. Um, I think we're also going to um, put together at the end of this, maybe um, sort of a, a, a scholarly article that um, talks about some of the uh, the data that we've collected, um, shares some of the stories, um, and thinks through some of the solutions that um, our interviewees proposed um, from across the university spectrum, be they students, faculty, or staff. I think that's really important uh, and really exciting. Um, and you know, I think unfortunately we haven't had a chance yet as a larger you know national international community to sort of pause um, and say what's going on? What do we need to be doing, right? Um, because we're all sort of gasping for air, right? Um, and, you know, hopefully we can help facilitate some of that. Um, and so that's sort of the, the longer term goal. And finally, uh, we want to see all of these interviews put into an archive. And so we've been um, talking to uh, an archive, uh, University of uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill um, has talked about perhaps hosting this. Um, uh, we've been in talks with others and they will wind up somewhere. Um, there's some uh, good, uh, you know, survey data that um, that comes along with the interviews. It is, there's there's some good stuff. Go to the archive. Um, but no, really, uh, they, I, I hope that researchers of the future are going to be able to use this um, and really think through what we've all um, been going through after a moment when we can all just take a breath and, and be. I want to thank my guests today. I want to remind everybody that you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And you can learn more about this project. I'll be sure to tweet out, um, and I hope my guests will as well, um, links to their own uh, aspects of this project. So we'll want to hear more about that and keep in, in touch with you as it, as it develops. This is uh, it should said at the top and just say here as we're concluding that this project, this Bearing Witness Oral History Project, is partially sponsored by the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest of Villanova University, which is also um, a co-sponsor of some of my COVID calls work. So thanks to them for having the foresight to support this, these projects. And um, William, Fenn, and Kira, thanks for what you're doing and thanks for making time to talk today on COVID calls. Stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow, five o'clock.